Okay, I want to uh, I want to finish up a few key points from Parshas Bullock that uh, that we didn't get to finish. Then we'll go on to Pinchas. Hopefully today we'll get there. I don't know for for sure, but uh, we're going to do the very best we can. Okay, if you take a look at uh, you've seen the what do you call it already? The uh, uh, Bullock Bullock and and Bullock and and uh, Billam. Keep trying to uh, uh, Bilam keeps trying to curse the Jewish people, and it doesn't work out. And uh, at a certain point, Bullock gets frustrated. And then, if you take a look, um, Bullock is frustrated. And then, take a look. I was, let me just find it one second. Let me get, get my bearings here. Um, Just one second, just one second. Here, and starting on page 866. So, Billam, is, Billam has gotten, what do you call it? Billam has gotten, uh, uh, he, he's already messed up. And Bullock is frustrated that here he is, he's sending him to go curse, and he says a blessing. If you take a look on 866, on uh, five lines from the top, Vayomer elav Bolok, lechna iti. Everybody see that? 866, five lines up. Bolok says to Bolok, go with me, al makom acher, asher tirenu misham, where you'll see the Jewish people. Efes katsehu sire, you'll see the edge of them. Vikulo lo sire, you won't see the entire group of the Jewish people. Vikovdo li misham. And curse, curse the people from there. So you'll see the edge of the people, but you won't see the entire people. The first time he saw the entire Jewish people, he's standing up on a, on a mountain, and he looks and sees the Jewish people, and it turns into a bracha. So Bullock says, all right, that's not going to work. Let's go somewhere else. This is where you only see the edge of the people, but you won't see the entire people. So commentaries say, what's the difference? You see the edge of the people, you see some of the people, you see now you don't see all the people, you see some of the people. So the answer is, the answer is that there's a difference in how you look when you compare the Jewish people to other nations. Compare us to other nations. Okay? Compare us to any, pick any nation in the world and you compare us. When you stop and think, in B'nai Brak, which was a city of 100,000 people, and we're going back quite a few years, they had over 100,000 people in B'nai Brak and they didn't have a police department. There was no police department in B'nai Brak. Now how could you, I mean, imagine any American city Imagine any American city without a police, 100,000 people and no police department. Imagine what it would look like. It'd be absolute mayhem. And that's just in America. I mean, there are other countries in Venezuela. Well, never mind. But uh, imagine, just imagine, uh, imagine what this would look like in, in, in any other city in the world. So what happens? Why is that? Okay, because in B'nai Brak, you know, tell you what, what's considered crime in B'nai Brak is, you know, somebody benching too fast. That's uh, somebody missing minion. That's crime. That's crime in B'nai Brak. You know, somebody, uh, you know, somebody didn't put on fill in Rabbeinu Tam. You know, you know the, the, the violent crime didn't exist. In B'nai Brak, eventually they had to get a police department because people were coming in from outside B'nai Brak and breaking into houses. But, you know, people, you know, guys learning in Kolol are generally not guys who are breaking into houses and beating people up and robbing banks. So when you look at the Jewish people in mass and you compare us to other people, you compare us to other, we look pretty good. And Bullock is concerned about that. He says, listen, we can't, we can't do it this way because compared to other nations, it's, it's a no-brainer. These people are too good. They're too good. Ephes Katseyutira, I want you to pick out small pieces. Small like Paul, Paul, because we do have flaws. A little bit of talking in shul over here, and over there somebody's speaking Lashon Hara, and over there somebody, somebody did steal a little bit of money, and somebody embezzled, and somebody, we do have our flaws. That means that you can't compare us on, on, a, on a group level, as a group, we're too good. We're just too good. I, I'm not trying to brag or anything, <laughs> but we are. You know, what, what, we consider, what we consider misbehavior in the rest of the world would be considered, a, well, you, you, you get a Medal of Honor. You know, they always say, well, Jews are always fighting. Jews aren't fighting. Jews may bicker. Jews may argue. You know, you may have a little fight in the shul and you're upset with the gabai because he didn't give you an aliyah. And two people, you know, two guys, are, two guys are upset because he took his parking space. They're not shooting each other. They're not beating each other up. They're not taking guns and mowing down 25 people. That's not, that's not happening. 
right? Jews don't do that. You know, it doesn't, it's an exceptional case. Well, the guy went so oh, God, this guy got violent, this guy. But it's, it, it's so few and far between. It's what's called the, that's why I told you, mitoch genusan atoshomea shivchan. When the criticism of the Jewish people is already part of our praise. If you could criticize us because we speak Lashon Hara, because we got, uh-oh, they're speaking Lashon Hara, well, that tells you what kind of people we are. Right? Because if you turn on a television, chas v'shalom, and, and you watch a soap opera, chas v'shalom, right? What are these people talking about all day? Right? All they're doing is talking about people and gossiping about people. My father used to see, like, like, like my bubby and my mother, you know, they'd be watching a soap opera. You know, my father would walk past it, he'd stop, he'd look, you know, the doctors in the hospital or whoever these people are, whatever, whether it has the stomach churns or whatever the, 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 whatever the soap opera, my father would be looking in for a second, he goes, don't these people ever work? <laughs> That's all they do is stand around talking all day. You know, the doctor and the nurse are talking. Somebody's dying on the table. And they're, and they're talking about, you know, I can't believe Claire said that. You know, <laughs> well, listen, man, you know, somebody's got an open heart surgery. To, you know, where, where are you? <laughs> you know, and my father was like, whatever these people work. You know, all they do is talk, talk, talk all day. So, so the criticism of the Jewish people means it's an exception. That shows you how good we are. If you could pick on somebody, oh, do you know that guy, that guy, uh, you know, he didn't dab Marv yesterday. Da, 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 you know, uh-oh, he didn't dab in Marv, right? That tells you what, what's expected of us. That tells you what's expected of us. There are very few people, very few people in, uh, in, 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 in certain countries, you know, if they didn't dab in Marv, you know, that we'd be okay with them. You know, just, just to stop shooting people and stop beating, torturing people, you'd be okay. So that's, that's Ephes Ketseu. First of all, take a look only at the edge of the Jewish people. That's, there's a famous story the, 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 there's a famous story about the, um, the mother lion says to the little uh, so the mother lion says to the little lion uh, um, he's got a couple of little, lion, little, little lions what are they called? Cubs? The little lion cubs they, she says to them uh, bears are also called little ones are called cubs right? okay so the mother lion says to her cubs uh, listen guys I'm tired of providing of, of cooking for you it's time to go fend for yourselves now you're going to have to go get your own dinner by the way, lions got a good attitude because the mother lion is the one that goes out and does the hunting. It's the lion, it's, it's the what do you call it? The mother lion goes out and does the hunting, brings it back, and then Tati gets the first. He he's the one who gets to eat. He just sits under the sun all day. I like it. It's like he's in Colo. <laughs> and she's working <laughs> and she brings home the food I like their attitude right? and she goes hunting doing all the work and he gets you know and then he just, you know, he sits there eating it so the, uh, they're onto something so the, uh, the uh, what do you call it the, uh, the, uh, the mother lion says to the cubs you could go I want you to go hunting for food they said where should we go you can go anywhere you want you're the king of the forest you're the king of the, the, king of the jungle Nobody, everybody's afraid of lions lions can go anywhere they want take anything you want nobody's going to mess with you Okay, so they go scampering off, and they start heading for a village, and as they get to the village, there's a big billboard. In the village, there's a giant billboard, and on this billboard, there's a giant mural, a giant picture of Samson ripping apart a lion. So they immediately they come walking, they see this thing, they turn around, they go running home, and Mom, whoa, 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 we went into the village, and the first thing we see is a big billboard of a, of a man ripping apart a lion. What's going on? You told us not to be afraid. He says, Dumb, don't you understand? If it was something that happened every day, it was a regular occurrence, they wouldn't be putting it up on a billboard. It's because it's an exception, and it's a one time in history, that's why they put it up on the billboard. That means when there's something, when you make an issue out of something, you know, oh, you know my mother told me she was once in shul, my parents were once in shul, and a guy actually punched another guy in shul. Right? They were in shul, and some guy, two guys were talking, and the guy went Shh, like that, and, and, and they kept on talking, so he just turned around and clocked the guy right in Shul. And I, and I missed Shul that day. Can you believe it? I was, I, well, I was in Israel. <laughs> I was in Israel. I meant that because of my mother. You know, so the guy clocked. Now, in all the years I was in Shul, nobody ever got clocked. Right? Nobody ever, what, nobody ever got yeah, punched. One time in, uh, that I know of, some guy got punched. Up, and that's the story that keeps going. Now, can you imagine if this was an Italian wedding? And I tell you, yeah, you know, it's an Italian wedding and somebody got punched, right? <laughs> You know, you know, you know, what, what else? You know, what else? I knew a guy who held lights. He, he was a guy who he, 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 carried, he carried lights for a photographer. And he did all sorts of weddings in New York, not Jewish weddings. Were there. So he told me that once he was working in an Italian wedding, and as they came in through the back, they came in through the back of the wedding hall, they noticed a, <laughs> there was a pool of blood on the ground. He said, what's that? He says, that's where the groom's friends beat up the caterer. 
right? That's before the wedding started, right? You know, you know, so, so okay, you know, somebody got beaten up, you know, that's, that's, uh, but, oh, by a Jew, <gasps> oi, somebody got punched, oh, my goodness, you know, why, why? That tells you who we really are. If you're making a big deal, that means you expect it better from us. And therefore, Ephes could say Utira, number one. Number two, turn to page 868. You have to pay attention, it's very close, it's very subtle now. So, Bilam tries again. Vayar Bilam, five lines from the bottom. Vayar Bilam kitov v'nei Hashem levorich es Yisrael, v'lo halach kefam v'fam likras nechoshim. He didn't resort to, uh, how does the Eretzko translate his sorcery? How does he translate divinations? Vayashas el abidbor ponov. He turns to the desert. Vayisa Bilam es enov. Now pay attention very carefully. Vay, two lines from the bottom. Vayisa Bilam es enov. Vayares Yisrael shochen lishvatav. He sees the Jewish people dwelling, divided by tribes. Remember, they're all divided up three, three, three. They have a very organized manner of being divided. Vatihi Allah ruach elokim, and the Spirit of God rested on him. Now, why don't you look at Rashi? Rashi on the left column, three lines from the bottom on the left column. If you find it, please show the person next to you. Three lines from the bottom on the left column. Shochen lishvatav. Ra'a kol shevet v'shevet, he saw, excuse me, he saw every tribe, shochen la'atzman, they were dwelling by themselves, ve'enan mil ravim, they weren't mixed together, it wasn't, it wasn't haphazard, and it was all very organized, number one. And then it says, Ra'a she'en pischeyen mechuvanim zekin neged zeh, he saw that their entrances weren't facing each other. Shelo yotzit zosochel ho'chavero. I want to ask you a question, gentlemen. Imagine this is your home. And that's your living room window. And you've got a beautiful view. There's nothing built. There's an empty lot next to you. And that's your whole, that whole window, that's a bay window you have there. And then somebody buys that lot, and they build a home on that lot, which they have a right to. And then they open a bay window facing your bay window. How would you feel? How would you feel? What? Or, and why would you feel irritated, Steve? <laughs> yes. Why would you feel irritated? What? I was special, now I'm not anymore. You were special and now you're not anymore? What, I mean, uh, I don't know about special. What would you say, Jake? Because people can look into your house now. Keep a look at your outside. There's an invasion of my privacy. I mean, you know, you know, I can't get up at about 11:30, have a midnight snack in my pajamas. You know, I can't walk around the house like Tarzan, uh, kick open the refrigerator, grab a hunk of salami, and take a bite out of it because I'm too distinguished for that. You know, I shalom. I couldn't let anybody watch when well, nobody's watching. Something else. You know, I can't walk around the house like looking like Tarzan, and I can't, I can't do what I want to do. Also, this guy, I got no privacy anymore. You'd be irritated, right? It may be frustrated. I don't want people looking in my house. Right? That's not what Rashi says. What does Rashi say? He saw that their entrance is two lines from the bottom. He saw their entrances that are not facing each other. That he shouldn't look into the other guy's tent. What's your concern when you build a home, and I don't want somebody's home facing my home, is your concern that he shouldn't look into your home? Or is your concern that you shouldn't look into his home? Oh, that's a completely different ball game. That means, by the way, there's a halacha. It's called hezek re'iyah. Hezek re'iyah means, and this is the Gemara Baba Basra talks about, we learned this in Baba Basra, you are not allowed to go peeking into people's windows. And you're not allowed to look over a fence into people's yards. It's called Hezek Reef. A guy's got a fence, a wall. You're not allowed to go give a glance what's happening. And if you're walking around at night and it happens to be well lit up, and you can see right into houses because it's dark outside, people have their lights on, you're not allowed to look into It's one thing if you accidentally you glance up. But you know, this is a, mm, 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 right? Or they call America, it's called being a peeping Tom. And it's illegal to be a peeping Tom, and it, which means people probably do it all the time. Right? So, you know, in Manhattan, you know, where everything is tight, you know, you take a, get yourself a high-powered binoculars and you look at the people's house and all you see is other people looking with their binoculars at you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of the, hey, you know, <laughs> hey bro, you're the guy. <laughs> right? That's illegal. 
So what is the concern of a Torah Jew? You're not allowed to look into other people. I don't want to invade his property. I don't want to invade his privacy. Besides my own, I don't want to be invaded. What's the concern of the Jewish people? This is what Bilaam, what's Bilaam really impressed with? Had Bilaam seen a structure that indicates that people don't want other people looking into their homes? All right, that everybody wants. What he sees about the Jewish people, what he's so impressed with, is that they're trying to avoid looking into the other guy's home. Now, why does this really trick, why does this really get to a Bilaam? All right, this is the beauty of it. What did we say about Bill? What was his character trait? One of, one of his character traits is an ayin ra'a. An ayin ra'a, begrudging eye. Remember we said, Bilaam is a guy who's jealous. There's a many, he's, he never met anybody he wasn't jealous of. Where does jealousy come from? Jealousy comes from because you're always looking at other people. You're always looking at what's going on by the other guy. You're always looking at other people's business. You're always poking your nose and saying, oh, what's going on over there? For a Bilaam, that's a way of life. Of course, what do you mean you can't look into another guy's house? How can you live like that? How can you not try to figure out what's going on? How much money have you got? What's happening in your bank account? What's happening with his parents? What's happening with his brother? And what's happening? You're, you're always living in somebody else's backyard. And all of a sudden he sees people say, hey, listen, there's a privacy over here. I'm not going to peek in by you. You're not going to peek in by me. We, we have privacy. And therefore the, the entrances of the tents were never facing each other. They did it in a way that, that maintains a level of tzniyas. And that's what Bill, that's what a Billum is so that's what a Billum is so impressed with, and it's an important lesson in life. Yeah, because you can live your life looking at other people, live your life looking at mind your own business, stay in your own dollar, stay in your own house. Well, you're looking at you're, you're living. Then there's no way a person that has no peace of no peace of mind. A person is always busy busy looking at the other guy's car and at the other guy's house and at the other guy's wife and at the other guy's this and the other guy's that. Okay, now take a look. I just want to go through this quickly because of uh, because of what he called. In, if you look in, in this whole section of Bilaam, there's an interesting statement. The Gemara says that at one point, at one point, this whole section of Bilaam, the Gemara wanted to include in Kriyashma. You know, we have three paragraphs that we include in Kriyashma. So the Gemara says that at one point, they were considering including the entire story of Bilaam and Bullock in the Kriyashma. And then they decided in the end now. We do say one part of it, Matovu Ohalecha, which is Pasuk, okay? we say this, Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkin Asachet we say that every morning. Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov on page 870, third line. We do say Matovu Ohalecha. But there was an idea, they had, they had a, what we call a Havamina, that they, at one point, they did want to include the entire section of Bilam and Bullock in the Kriyashma. And the question is why? In the end they decided not to. But why would they have wanted, I mean, there's a big Torah out there. Why would you include this in the Kriyashma? Why not include, at one point they wanted to include the Aserah Sadibros, the Ten Commandments. Why would they even have thought to include the section of Bilam and Bach? There's a remarkable answer. Purim. In the Kriyashma. Purim. What's that? Because of Purim. Why? Well, because uh, uh, the whole uh, shift that happened in... Okay, but that's on Purim, so we should read it on Purim. Why in the Kriyashma? Why in the Kriyashma? So what is Kriyashma, gentlemen? What is Kriyashma? It's an affirmation of our faith, right? That's the ultimate affirmation of our faith. You know, there's a story in, uh, the, I think it was the Yom Kippur War. There was a guy, there was a tank. There was an Israeli tank that, uh, um, that, that got, uh, was behind the enemy lines. And uh, somehow the enemy, the guy shot the guy shot a missile, the, the, first, the tank, the, the Syrian tank shot a missile at this Israeli tank and he missed him. And then he took another shot, it went too far. Then he took another shot and it landed, too, it landed too short. Now apparently when the tank warfare, it's a maximum of three shots. If you miss the first two times, it's only because you have engaged the distance, the third one's going to hit. So this guy knows he's about to die. It happened to be a left wing, it happened to be a kibbutznik, a guy kibbutz who knew nothing about Judaism. So he, he knows he's about to die, and he goes, Shema Yisrael, I don't know the rest. Shema Yisrael, I don't know the rest. And I reel out. And just then a tank retriever came over the ridge, and his tank retriever and picked them up and pulled them out, and the guy lived. Wow. Right? But that's the instinct of Shema Yisrael is, is, is basic what he called in Judaism. You know the story, the other, there was another story with the tanks. There was a group of, there was a group of Israeli guys. There was a, like, the, have you ever heard of Arachim? Arachim is one of these Israeli Balchuva movements. They, they do outreach. So they had a, you know, a bunch of Israelis became Balchuvas. So they had like a Shabbaton. 
and then Friday night they were serving the Friday night meal. So they had all the uh, the alumni of our Achim, and he had the staff, the rabbis who were there, so they served this meal. And at the meal for dessert, they served watermelon. So one of these guys takes a bite of watermelon, he says, So one of the rabbis comes over, he says, Listen, with the shakol, you know, you're yotze, b'dievet, after the fact, you're yotze, but the, the correct bracha on shakol, on watermelon is adama, bori pri adama. He goes, I know, but I make a shakol. He goes, yes, I know you make a shakol, but the correct bracha is adama. He says, yeah, but I make a shakol. He says, okay, why do you make a shakol? He says, we were in the war. I was a member of a tank, a tank division, and we were on a, we were on a, what do you go, we were surrounded by Syrian tanks. And we knew that we were goners, right? We knew this was it. We had about 10 tanks, and we were, we were surrounded by Syrian tanks, we were goners. And one guy says over the communication network, is, does anybody know how to pray? There's no one in our division who was religious. Nobody knew the first thing about prayer. There was one guy from a kibbutz who knew one thing. He knew how to make a bracha shahakol. So this guy goes, bracha tashakol, shahakol ne'ebivro. Boom! Shot a missile, knocked out a Syrian tank. So we all started going unison. Bracha tashakol, shahakol ne'ebivro. Boom! Rabbi, we knocked out all the Syrian no tanks, way. and we all survived. He goes, if shahakol's good enough for Syrian tanks, it's good enough for watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the shahakol, uh, no, the, the bracha is, the bracha is, what do you call it? I don't know if the Syrians answered, I mean, but the, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 maybe, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, so, 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 Shema Yisrael is fundamental. Now, I want to ask you a question. How do you know any of this? How do we know any of what, what took transpired between Bilaam and Balak? We know what Hashem commanded Moshe, because Moshe wrote the Torah and it says, Vayomer Hashem al Moshe, Lamar, Vayadaber Hashem al Moshe, countless times in the Torah. How does anybody know what the conversations were that took place between Bilaam and Balak? How nobody was there. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't there. How does anybody know about this? You know what the answer is? The answer is, you're right, they weren't. This is evidence of the prophecy. If we could know about this, this is evidence that the entire Torah is given to Moshe Rabbeinu through prophecy. And since Kriya Shema is fundamentals, reaffirmation, the fundamentals of our faith, so they thought to include this Parsha in because nothing affirms our faith in the Torah like this Parsha. Because if you believe in this, then you believe the entire Torah is a prophecy. Because if you can believe that something transpired between Bilaam and Bullock and Moshe Rabbeinu knew about it, because Hashem, uh, there's only one way Moshe Rabbeinu could have known this. It's only if Hashem told him about it. If you believe this, you believe the entire package. And therefore, they actually considered putting this in the Kriya Shema, not because of the content as much as because of what it indicates. And it indicates full belief, full belief in the prophecy of the Torah. It's an interesting thing when you think about it. How does anybody know about this? Everything else in the Torah is Moshe Rabbeinu talking to the Jewish people. And all of a sudden, now you got conversations between Bilaam and Bullock, and he went here, and he went there, and they did this, and they did that, and the other. Who was there to report it? And therefore, the Torah, and even what we said last week about when the, the, the remember the Medrash that the Amoris were hiding in the mountains, and the mountains crushed them, the mountains crunched together, and it was only two Jews who came up afterwards who reported it. So we know how they knew it. How did anybody know this? Who was, who was eavesdropping over here? The answer is no one. No one was eavesdropping, and we know it because that it shows that we have the faith in the Torah. Yes, yeah, somebody had a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, Right, except the difference between Bereshus and this is that we're here, and there's an earth. And that's pretty much evidence that it was created. The fact that there's an earth, you, know, you understand, it says God created the earth, and here I am, and here it is, right? That's pretty strong evidence, that's pretty solid evidence. Whereas over here, we don't, I don't know, he says he gave a bracha, this is what he did, three times, seven times, I built an altar, built a thing, who was there, who saw? We didn't get a report, there were no spies that defected over to the Jewish people. Okay. Yeah, Mary, good. Is there a commentary about some uh, deep uh, relationship between Purim and this parasha? Because of what Aman was trying to destroy. I, I don't know of any. I don't know of any offhand. And also Bilam by Balak's. Uh, I don't know of any offhand. I'd have to look around. The, the, the only because thing we know. Because it turned all the way around. That's yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's always been the story with the Jews. You know, they tried to destroy us. You know, we we survived. Let's eat. You know, that, that's what the holidays are. You know, <laughs> enemies tried to kill us. We survived. Let's say, let's eat. That's what they, but, so, you know, that's what people say about the holiday. But I, I, there, there might be, there might be, we have to find a connection. But I don't know of one offhand. Yeah, please. So how, how would this be different than, like, 
like parts of the Torah, like about Abraham or Adam or Rishon or Nabu, would that mean that had to be passed down? Because there it says openly that Hashem spoke to Avram Avinu, and then Avram, right, exactly as you say, he passed it down to Yitzchak, and Hashem spoke to Yitzchak, and it says Hashem spoke to Yaakov. And over here, we don't have, we, there's a conversation between two people over here that nobody, nobody reported to us. Who reported this? So it can be possible that the Lama Balak reported it? It doesn't say that anywhere. To the contrary, they got killed. It could be, but it doesn't, it doesn't say that's not why we know it. It doesn't say, well, Balak then came to the Jewish people and said, oh, by the way, I want to tell you this story. To the, to be, to, besides the fact that he certainly got no, no reliability. I don't know if he, what he's telling us is true. I think about it. It's something to think about. Okay, take a look now as we go to the most single most violent, uh, uh, the single most violent e- episodes in the Torah. So Bilam gives Balak some advice. And he says to Balak, look, let me, before I leave, let me give you a way of the cursing didn't work, I'll give you a different idea. And he says, the God of these people hates immorality. The God of the Jewish people hates immorality. And the Gemara says there is nothing that is detestable to God is people who walk around the marketplace un- improperly dressed. So that people walk around naked. And then naked doesn't mean naked. Nobody walks around absolutely naked. It means that people who are dressed in a very unsneous manner. And people walk around, especially the way you see, walk on the streets today, unfortunately, you know, you, you can't, you know, everywhere you go, you get, you're, 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 it's just insulting. It's insulting the way people dress. So, Bilam comes to Bullock, he says, listen, I got a plan for you. The Gemara explains what the plan was. He says, the Jewish people are interested in buying silk. Set up tents, and there were the Jewish men, you know, they, as they passed various villages or towns, they used to go shopping. You leave an old lady outside and put a young lady inside. And the guy will come and he'll speak to the old lady and she'll give him a price. And the young lady from inside will give him a cheaper price. Well, you know, they're Jewish. And then they'll go in for the cheaper price. And by the second or third time, she'll say to the guy, make yourself comfortable. And the young man will then put out wine for them. And this was before there was a decree that Jews are not allowed to drink non-Jewish wine. That's a rabbinic decree. And then the Jewish man would drink wine. And then the young lady, once he drinks wine, a person who gets drunk, then the Gemara says all forms of immorality become permissible to somebody who's drunk. And then when he would solicit the young lady, she would say to him, okay, before that, you're going to have to embrace my idol. You have to worship my idol. So the Jewish people got involved in immorality and in idol worship, Baal Peor. That was the advice Bilam gave to Bullock. So it says in Pesach, four lines from the top at 874, Yisrael Bashitim. They were in a place called Shittim, and there's one opinion of the Gemara that it was called Shittim because they behaved in a foolish manner, which is called Shtus, which is the root of Shittim, is Shtus. They behaved in a foolish manner. They started sinning with the Moab daughters. So, the uh, what do you call it? The, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the judges to start executing the Jewish people, any of the people that, that, that have been involved in this idol worship. And then if you skip down, uh, eight lines from the bottom. V'hine ish mi b'nei Yisrael ba, a man comes along, v'yakre v'alecha v'sa midyonis, he brings a, a midyanite woman, l'ene Moshe l'ene kol adas b'nei Yisrael, right in the full eyes of view of Moshe and the rest of the Jewish people, so he takes this Midianite woman into a tent to cohabit with her. And the Mishnah, the Guarashi brings down, look what he said to Moshe Rabbeinu. Le'ene Moshe, it's the left column of Rashi. And then you see, you see an important, important message here in human nature. Left column, five lines from the top. Le'ene Moshe, why does it emphasize that he did this right in the full view of Moshe? Amar lo, Moshe. So Billa, this, this man, who the Torah does not name until next week's parasha, we'll see why, he happens to be the prince of a tribe. He said, Zua suro muteris. Is this one permissible or is she forbidden or permissible? This Midianite woman. Im tomar asura, and if you tell me she's forbidden, bas Yisro mihi who allowed you to marry the daughter of Yisro, who is a Midianite? Sounds good, right? Sounds good, good, good taina, right? Good taina. All right? What's, what did he forget? What's this man overlooking, obviously? 
Moshe Rabbeinu converted her, number one, and number two, that was before the Torah was given. And number three, that conversion depends on what a person's motivation is. I mean, you got a bunch of, a bunch of girls, a bunch of girls are coming to try to entice the Jewish men and try to get them to sin, and what, all of a sudden now she said, you know what, but I, I think I'll be a Jew. I'll think I'll be a good Jew, right? And Moshe Rabbeinu says, sorry, we're not accepting converts. There's no valid conversion here. So what happens? He takes her into a tent. Vayar Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akoit. Pinchas, the son of Elazar, is Moshe's great nephew, a grandson of Aaron. Vayoka mitocha eda v'ikach romach He takes a spear in his hand. Now, the uh, uh, the Mepharshim say that Pinchas comes over in the tribe of uh, Shimon, which is Zimri's tribe. They're outside the tent, and Pinchas says, "Hey, Pinchas says, hey." Who said, who said, you're firmer than we are? We also want to go. I also want to go in there. And he took the spear, and he had taken the spear, and he took off the, what's it called, the, the, the blade, and he was walking on it like a stick, like a cane. And they said, ah, see, the firmies want to join us. So they let Pinchas into the tent. That was his way of getting in. And then what does he do? He stares both of them. He nails them while they're in the act. So the plague had started, and the plague now stopped. 24,000 people started dying in this plague. What's going on here? So the Gemara says that there are all sorts of miracles that were done for Pinchas. And we have a very interesting halacha here, which is called Habol Aramis Kanoim Pogimbo. One who is consorting with a non-Jewish woman, someone whose heart is burning with zealousness for the sake of God is allowed to take the law. Vigilante action. Vigilanteism. Somebody whose heart is burning with zealousness for the sake of God, he's allowed to take the law into his own hands. He's allowed to be a vigilante and he's allowed to kill them. Now, don't anybody go grabbing spears just yet. Right? What this requires... What was the name of Death Wish? What's his name? The actor from Death Wish. You don't know who I'm talking Charles about. Try, yeah, what's the name? Charles, Charles Bronson. Bronson, right. You never saw Death Wish. Guys, you know you're so little. So Charles Bronson, there's a movie Death Wish. I saw this, I think I was probably about 15. So he's a vigilante. He's a vigilante. goes around killing muggers in New York. And the crime rates drop. Because <laughs> all the muggers in Central Park start getting nervous. All of a sudden they're getting clobbered. There's the only time in Torah that we find vigilanteism is permissible means somebody whose heart, there's zealousness, and he's burning with zealousness for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he sees a Jewish man consorting with a non-Jewish woman is allowed to take action and kill them both. Now, there are several laws here. If the couple involved in what they're doing, if they would separate, the moment they separate from each other, he's not allowed to kill them. If he kills them, a moment later, he separated, he, he kills him, then he's a murderer. Wow. Number one. Number two, the Medrash says, the Gemara says, six miracles were done for Pinchas. One of the miracles is that as they came to attack him, that they didn't separate. He comes in with the spear. He, once he got into the tent, he took out the shaft, he took out the thing, hooked it up, and went after them. So the Medrash says, number one, there's a miracle that they didn't separate. Number two, the top of the, uh, what's it called, the, the doorpost lifted up. He nails the two of them and picks them up on a spear. Wow. And then marches them around the Jewish camp to show everybody why they got killed, which is probably embarrassing. Not for him. And as the manager says, it is a miracle that they didn't come sliding off the spear. They, they stayed on the spear. And he shows the entire Jewish people what he did. And that puts an end to the plague. Now, I wanted to comment, I saw a phenomenal shot, really a phenomenal shot. You understand all these miracles had to take place. The other miracle is that Zimri didn't yell out, otherwise the members of his tribe would have come in and they would have gotten Pinchas before he could kill him. So I saw a phenomenal, phenomenal idea here. The Medrash says that six miracles were done. There's, a, there's one opinion that there were 12 miracles done for him. One of the questions is, why was the miracle necessary that they continued doing the Avera? If Zimri would have separated himself from her, so then he wouldn't have to be killed and none of it would have happened. Why, did, why was that miracle necessary? Let him get out of it. Let him, let, him avoid, let him avoid the trouble. Why is that miracle necessary? 
The answer is that if Zimri would have separated, so then Pinchas wouldn't be allowed to kill him. So what would happen? Pinchas would go into the tent, telling everybody that he's going, and what his decoy was, he told them he's going in to do an Avera. So now he's going to go into the tent. Zimri stops what he's doing, so Pinchas can't kill him. So now Pinchas comes walking out of the tent, then what's ever you going to think of Pinchas? Oh, you know, he took care of your business and he came out. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I was going to kill him, but I didn't. <laughs> oh, can you imagine the tabloids that have a field day with this? So Pinchas, his own reputation is on the line. So the miracle for Pinchas was that they don't separate in order that Pinchas should be able to get away with kill. Should, should be able to kill him. Otherwise, Pinchas, how's he ever going to get past this? So he goes in and he kills him. Now, you have to see, very important, because the Allah is that we can no longer do this. You cannot kill a Jewish man who's consorting with a non-Jewish woman. If you could nowadays, we would run out of spears. So you can't do that, right? That's number one. Number two, the reason we can't do it is because we do not have that level of zealousness for God. And in order to be at the level of a Pinchas, it's got to be 100%. If it's 99% because I'm concerned for God's honor, and there's 1%, because this guy always takes my parking space. And he kills him, then he's a murderer. It's got to be 100%. And nowadays, we can't say that we're 100%. <coughs> Nobody could claim 100%. But I want to show you something more here. Take a look at Rashi. <coughs> An interesting conversation. It's seven lines from the bottom. It says, Vayar Pinchas, Pinchas sees. Says Rashi, Ra'a Maisa Vidiskar Halacha. Pinchas saw what was happening and remember the halacha. Amar Lola Moshe. Everybody see where that is? Please show the person next to you if you if you if you find a show that the person next to you. Ra Maisa Vidiskar Halacha. Amar Lola Moshe. Pinchas said to Moshe, Thank you, yes, please. Mikublani Mimcha, thank you very much. Mikublani Mimcha, I have a Tradition from you. Haboel Aramis Kanoim Pogimbo. Didn't you teach us that one who's consorting, so someone zealous is allowed to kill him? Omar Lo, so Moshe said, Karaina de Igrasa Iu Levi Parvanka. The one who delivers the letter, let him carry out the contents. Meaning, you're the one who brought the information. You thought of it, you do it. You see, I understand. How did Pinchas know that such a halacha exists? How did he even know such a halacha exists? Because Moshe Rabbeinu taught them. When did Moshe Rabbeinu teach them? When he came down from the mountain. He taught Kal Yisrael Torah. Now, I want to ask you, gentlemen, you know, if Pinchas would have said to Moshe Rabbeinu, I didn't quite get it clear. You taught us Torah, and I think it wasn't quite clear when you said there's a grama and a garmi and there's a migu, and you could, you, you are responsible. It's basically day shemai. It's potter be day You know, I can understand that there are some technical problems that he didn't get clear in a shear. That I understand. But over here, there was one day to, today's shear is the subject is kanoim pogimbo. Vigilanteism. I guarantee you nobody was sleeping during that shear. It had all the ingredients for a Hollywood bestseller. You got a, you got a, what do you call it? You got a, you got a, 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 a little bit of immorality, and there's a shiksa there, and there's a spear. You got everything that you need. I guarantee you, Shid Pitlis got it straight the first time. He knew all the rules. So why is he coming to Moshe Rabbeinu now? Didn't you teach us that there's a halacha like this? So why, why, did, why, 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 why does Pinchas have any doubt? The answer is he doesn't. But in general, there's a lesson. Before you do something drastic, in Judaism, drastic Judaism is always more fun than going into the base measures and learning a tosos. Right? Doing something heroic is always good. You know, the way to go, sabotaging the train tracks on Bar Ilan is certainly a lot more fun than going and saying Tachanun on Mondays and Thursdays. Right? Before you go and start sabotaging things and breaking things and spearing people, before you do that, if you ever have such an idea, you know what? Go ask. Go check. Go double check it. Because if you're ever excited, there's a rule in life. If you're ever excited to do a mitzvah, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Because we don't get excited about doing mitzvahs. How many, how many people are excited about, really excited 
really excited about putting on filling in the morning. Like, oh good, my favorite. You know, it's filling at six o'clock in the morning in a frigid Yerushalayim morning when I'd rather be under the cover. You know, it, let, let's, let's be real. So if you're really excited and you're buzzing about doing a mitzvah, just slow down. Just slow down. If it needs to be done, you'll do it. But slow down. If you're too excited about it, it's not a good sign. And therefore, Pinchas goes and he confirms, he can, he, first he consults with Moshe Rabbeinu, because we're talking about so, some serious drama over here, number one. Number two, there's another giveaway. If you take a look, take a look at what Pinchas does. In Pesach Zion, I saw one of the commentaries points out, and this is, this is the true indication. Vayar Pinchas ben Elazar ben Arga, six lines from the bottom. Bottom. He stands up among, from among the congregation. First he saw, then he picked up the spear. Some people are always walking around with the spear looking for something. Some people got the spear in their hand already. Right? Some people are, they're, they, they, they're, they're Hashem's agents to enforce Judaism in this world, except, on everybody except themselves. Right? They see everybody else's flaws. Right? They, know, they know what everybody else is doing wrong. Right. But they're doing wrong. No, they're, they're righteous tzaddikim. They're walking around with that spear all the time. It turns out they'll walk around with the spear. First see what's happening. You saw it's happening. You saw a problem. All right, you may have to resort to picking up a spear. Some people have got the spear in there. Some people always have the spear in there. That's not a good thing. Having the spear in your head is not a good thing. That's why, you know, in Judaism, the attitude is, say, a pinchas is allowed to take vigilante action. People are, the rest of us, we're not, we're not holding by pinchas level yet. We're not holding by Pinchas level. We leave the vigilante action for, 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 for the Pinchases of the world. And in general, the attitude should be, the attitude should be, before I still walk around seeing what everybody else is doing wrong, I gotta see what I'm doing wrong. But in, in the, the, we'll have to see tomorrow, we'll have to see tomorrow why it is, very curious, why it is that the Torah doesn't name these people. Why doesn't the Torah name these people? So we'll see tomorrow why the Torah names them later, and we'll see what kind of reward Pinchas gets. All right. <laughs>